Hello out there and welcome to the metagame. The series where we not only will be talking about board games, but we'll also be talking about talking about board games. I am your host, Chaz Marler, and in today's episode, I will be sharing a true tale of board gaming. An experience that I've had during my time in the board game hobby and what I have learned from it if anything. Afterwards, I will skim the YouTube comments for questions, and then we'll have an informal Q&A session. So to have one of your questions considered for the Q&A portion of our show, be sure to post it in the YouTube comments area, being sure to include the hashtag, hashtag TMG. And thank you to the user from the last show that commented that the hashtag TMG might actually be easier for people to write than hashtag the meta game. So thanks for that. This time we'll just be doing hashtag TMG. I will use a search tool to highlight those comments that have that hashtag during the Q&A period. Now, not all submitted comments will be featured on the show, but I do try to go back and reread all of them afterwards. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check over the comments real quick just to get a thumbs up that everything's working great. Thank you very much. Um, Kabuki for letting me know the audio and video is good. With that, allow me to set the scene for this particular true tale of board gaming. Our story begins, like so many other stories, in a small town in the Pacific Northwest during a game club meeting on a cold, cold winter's day about a year or two ago. And even though the high for the day was forecast to be only around 17 degrees Fahrenheit, a dozen or so dedicated gamers still braved the cold and met up at our town's community center, gathering together to partake in an afternoon full of board games, including my contribution to the day, Kingsburg. Now, among all the familiar faces there that day, there were a couple of newcomers. There was a middle-aged gentleman who showed up, who was there actually to drop off his very, very elderly mother, a, a kindly wrinkled raisin of a woman who we'll call Hyacinth. Now, Hyacinth wobbled her way into the community center using one of those wheeled walkers that converts into a chair that she could sit on. So upon depositing her at a nearby table, her son then left with barely a word, and the rest of us there tried to make Hyacinth as welcome as any first-time visitor to our game club. Uh, she mentioned to us that she enjoyed Scrabble, which we just happened to have a copy of available. and. Since I always enjoy a good word game, I bowed out of my game of Kingsburg that was about to begin, and together with a fellow member who we'll call Dee Dee, joined Hyacinth for the most bizarre game of Scrabble that I believe I shall ever play. As Hyacinth, sell as Hyacinth settled into her wheeled walker seat, Dee Dee and I started playing Scrabble with her. Well, not so much played Scrabble as we watched Hyacinth stare methodically at her array of letter tiles for painfully long spans of time before she'd finally placed nonsensical jumbles of letters down on the board. Now, eager to ex Eager, eagerly, eager to assist this scrambled, scrabble senior citizen, Dee Dee would correct Hyacinth's many, many spelling mistakes at first. But slowly, over the course of one agonizingly slow turn after another, Dee Dee eventually just gave in and joined me in staring longingly at the game of Kingsburg being played on the other side of the room. And then it got worse. Sometime after Hyacinth played the words Blorknats 
Kigitz and Lavam Dasher, her wheeled walker chair contraption thing that she was sitting on suddenly rolled out from out from beneath her and she fell right onto the floor with a crash. And everyone there just leapt up to rescue her and you know everyone helped her back up. Now fortunately she wasn't hurt, but at her age, you know, the entire room was still just filled with concern. Fortunately, a wave of relief washed over the room when her son returned mere minutes after that. So we informed him of his mother's spill onto the floor, relieved that he could then take her home and keep an eye on her after her tumble. However, it turned out that her son had only stopped by so that he could briefly notify his mother that the cold weather had caused a pipe to burst at a relative's house and that he had to go help them fix it. His only response to us to being told of his mother's spill was to quip, <laughs> she's quite the Scrabble player, isn't she? No, no, no. Hyacinth was not, in fact, quite the Scrabble player. Not unless the random assortment of letters sporkfnats had the meaning that I wasn't aware of. However, social etiquette prevented me from pointing that fact out to him at the time. Instead, I chose to reiterate that his mother had just been crumpled in a heap on the floor mere minutes ago. He, he nodded, turned around, and exited with neither his mother nor another word to the group. Okay, actually that's not entirely true, because as the community center's door closed behind him, he did announce back to us that, quote, somebody's going to have to take Hyacinth and give her a ride home. And then the door slammed shut behind him. And then it got worse. Everyone in the room sat, stunned with the same quizzical expression, wondering if everyone else had just heard that the same way and that they had heard it correctly. I mean, none of us knew this woman. I mean, where did she even live? So after the group collected our thoughts, someone smartly suggested simply calling Hyacinth's son to have him come back and retrieve his mother. Unfortunately, Nobody in the group knew her son's phone number, including Hyacinth. Well, fortunately, there was still over an hour left in the group's meeting time, you know, so the consensus was that surely, surely he would soon return to claim his misplaced mother. And then 10 minutes ticked by. 15, 20, 45. And before we knew it, the time that we had reserved at the community center had come to an end. And there was a, a very, very quiet, perplexed discussion about what to do next. I mean, if, if we just left Hyacinth at the community center, you know, would we find her still sitting there the next time we met, surrounded by Scrabble boards filled with incoherent gibberish? So, okay. We, we admitted that wasn't an option. Uh, eventually, two group members volunteered to take Hyacinth back to her home. And that, that is the moment when our game group discovered that Hyacinth wasn't just an ab abandoned el elderly woman who didn't know her son's phone number. She also didn't know where the community center was in relationship to her own house. Fortunately, the volunteers were able to make their way with Hyacinth back to the center of town and then from there traverse their way back to her neighborhood and finally back to the safety of her own home. Now, after that eventful cold winter's day, our game group never saw Hyacinth or her son ever again. Dee Dee, who endured the Scrabble game along with me, has never returned to our game club either. And I have yet to get in that game of Kingsburg that I planned to play on that day. But the experience wasn't a total loss. 
that most bizarre game of Scrabble that I believe I shall ever play has introduced an entire lexicon of new words into my vocabulary. And, you know, if that's not something to be totally Sporkfnats Lavum Dasher about, well, then I don't know what is. And that is today's true tale of board gaming. So, what I want to know is if your game group has ever had any interesting experiences. Um, I know I've, I've said before uh, that a lot of the stories and experiences that I have to tell about board games um, and the board gaming community are directly a result of going out and meeting people and talking to people and having those experiences. Um, so I want to know if my experiences are typical or somewhat abnormal. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go and go over to the YouTube comments area and do the searches for the TMG hashtag. And if you have anything like experience less, any strange true tales of board gaming of your own, let me know. And otherwise, I'm just going to go over to the comments section and look for questions. And we're going to do just a general Q&A today as well with the rest of our time. So uh, kind of a nice, relaxed conversation episode today. So let me go and grab my YouTube comments. And let me do my search. And move this out of the way. Thank you very much, little window. Now let's see what we got. Hello, everyone. Good to see you over here in the comments section. Oh. Okay, the first comment is that the hashtag TMG uh, can also stand for tasty, tasty Minstrel Games. So there's that. So, <laughs> so TMG, while trying to be easier to use and less confusing, may actually be more, more confusing. Um, all right. Someone asks if it's possible to get glasses that don't reflect the screen that you're looking at. Uh, honest question, not a joke. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've, I've struggled with that same thing, especially when I do normal videos, even just regular ones. Um, I Well, I guess I don't wear my glasses because they're reading glasses. So if I want to be able to read the YouTube's comments and check my streaming software to make sure everything's working uh, when I do this format, uh, the reading glasses are usually, usually a necessity because I want to be able to actually see and read the screen. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's places I can arrange the lights um, maybe I can not hold my head like that. I'll hold my... Oh, there we go. That might work. Um, I'll experiment with this. Maybe I can do something with uh, in post-production, like, you know, do a CGI effect. But anyway, yeah, the glare on the glasses is something that we may just have to live with because it's something that I've had to live with since fourth grade. So, all right, let's move on. Oh, it's the glare of my monitor. Oh, interesting. Not necessarily the lights, but maybe the monitor. Anyway, yeah. All right. Let's, 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 you know what? If that's the worst thing that happens to everybody today, uh, then we've all had an excellent day. So let's move on. Um, did you ever think of which game was the most blinged out one in your collection? And how much may have you invested in doing so? That is a good question. And... I have my game collection across the room from me, where I can see if I can just look around these really glary lights here. Um, the most blinged out game in, in my collection, this is one where I know that as soon as I answer this, I'm going to think of a better answer for it. But the most blinged out game may, at least one of them, will probably be Defenders of the Realm. Uh, because with Defenders of the Realm, some of the upgrades that I did for that one um, is I took um, HeroScape figures and I replaced the default little figures that come with Defenders with the Realm with HeroScape ones. And be between the normal HeroScape and Marvel HeroScape and perhaps even just a few like uh, Hero uh, D and D Hero Clicks figures, I was able to actually find really good replacements for nearly every figure in Defenders of the Realm. And then I um, got some really neat 
two-sided ceramic poker chips from Game Night, uh, G-A-M-E-K-N-I-G-H-T. Game Night makes these really neat ceramic poker tokens like, like things. And one of them has a skull and crossbones on one side and then a heart on the other side. And those are really good for tracking the Defender of the Realm uh, character's hit points. So between going through and, and searching and collecting a whole bunch of replacement uh, figures and then having a lot of the, uh, the tokens upgraded and replaced, uh, Defenders of the Realm is the first one that, that comes to mind. And, and like I said, I know that as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to go, oh my goodness, what about this game where I replaced everything? And, and, uh, but for now, it's, that's the one that, that comes to mind. I haven't done anything as insane as the gentleman who's doing this, the new series on Board Game Breakfast about component upgrades. He will actually go and print new ceramic tiles for like Carcassonne and, and his games and just, he goes crazy with it. It's a fascinating segment to me to, to watch. But I haven't done anything really as crazy as he has. But um, if you haven't seen, I can't remember the name of the segment. There's only been two or three uh, episodes of it so far. But um, there's a segment now in Board Game Breakfast that has started with this gentleman. And I really recommend checking it out. If for no other reason than to make yourself feel better about the money and time you've invested in your own upgrades because what he does is just insane and blows that away. All right. Um, someone mentioned, mentioned wobble, wobble, wobble. Woo! You know, I'm, I'm assuming that's in reference to the table. And I don't, I don't know how to tell you this, but this is actually even a different table than the wobbly tall one that I, I use when I want to stand in front of my game shelf and have a table. So apparently I'm plagued by wobbly tables. So I apologize for my table wobbliness. Uh, you know, maybe that could be my shtick. You know, maybe instead of hundreds of thousands of subscribers and views, maybe I can just be the wobbly table guy. I might want to rethink that plan. All right. Um, Let's see. <laughs> Someone mentions that they would rather play Alien Encounters over Kingsburg anyway. Uh, I can definitely see the comparison there. That actually might be a good video to do a head-to-head -head comparison of Alien Frontiers versus Kingsburg. Uh, personally, I think I also do enjoy Alien uh, Frontiers a little more, but honestly, I would play either one uh, given the chance. Given the chance! Um, apparently, you don't always get the chance, and sometimes you just have to... Uh, Watch it from across the room. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Kabuki Kid, for coming to Hyacinth's defense that her Scrabble words were perfectly cromulent words. Um, you have embiggened yourself in my heart um, for that kind comment for her. Okay. Um, let me go and check the comments again here. Oh, wow, we have 20 more. That just popped up. Woohoo! All right, let's see what we can see. Uh, uh, Mr. Coffee Fiend uh, took the time to mention his own experience, and he mentions that he was in a game group that, after putting up with an annoying player for several months, they all chipped in to buy him a train ticket back home in a distant state. Wow! That's group commitment, right? Right there. Um, that's, you know, on a more serious note, that's a real issue um, sometimes. That is a really delicate thing to, that that takes a lot of diplomacy. When you have, when you have an open game group, and someone who just doesn't mesh with the group, or someone who's annoying or a troublemaker infiltrates your group, and you you have an open open door policy and you know if you're if it's a game group that welcomes everyone in the community in you know what do you do when you have those those people and i I'm, I'm, and i'm going to be honest i've thought about doing segments on this topic for like the board game breakfast or just other other videos um, but i realized that uh, i personally have I don't, i'm not good at it I'm not good at discipline like that. Um, it, it takes a lot of, I'll have to work up the nerve to come up and approach someone. Uh, I've, 
I can't speak for him, but I have gotten the impression because this, this question has come up in other Q&As with Tom. And I get the impression that Tom doesn't suffer from that issue. And in game clubs that he runs and is managing, if there's someone that he has an issue with, he has no problem pulling them aside and diplomatically saying, hey, here's the problem. And I think that he has given very good advice in that. I think I could also spout out really good advice, but I know in my own experience, I find that a lot more difficult. So I try to really find the right place and the right time. And fortunately, in my own game group experience, that has worked. It has always worked out. We've had a couple of issues that always have kind of worked out and resolved themselves. But I would say from my own experience, um, I believe Tom's approach of being more direct and nipping it in the bud is actually a better course of action to take than what I have done in my own experience. I haven't taken my own advice. So it, when that comes up, um, while buying someone a train ticket to a far distant state is hilarious and really nice and uh, a uh, whatever it's called, um, when you do something that's, I can't think of the word right now. I'll just, you know what I'll do is I'll just edit it in later. Um, passive aggressive, that was the word. Nice passive aggressive ap approach to it. Um, that's probably not the best approach in all situations, obviously, but it is a good story. All right, let's go see what words I can forget how to pronounce next and go to the next comment. And YouTube comments jumped, I apologize. Um, Alana Watt asks that her school is running an activity day for 12 to 14 year olds and she has agreed to run some games. Do you have any recommendations for what to bring? Hey, this is a great opportunity for, uh, to take advantage of the back and forth we have going here. Hey, let's do this. I'm going to spout off a few off the top of my head, but I am going to have a miserable list. So. In, after this goes live and you're watching this non-live later on, let's post in the comments some suggestions for Alana of good games for a, an activity day for 12 to 14 year olds at a school. Um, off the top of my head, scanning the game shelf on the other side of the room, the one that I probably would start with um, and put at the top of your list is King of Tokyo. That one, uh, I've played that one with my own daughter uh, since she was six, I think. She couldn't even read the cards, but she started to recognize the art on the cards. And she enjoyed it. And she continues to enjoy it. And, uh, you know, now she's nine. And so King of Tokyo is one of those games I think is kind of an evergreen title. And people of all ages can appreciate it. So King of Tokyo is a very excellent one for 12 to 14 year olds. Um, another game that I know a lot of um, the younger people in our game club enjoy is uh, One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Um, that one always hits the table w when we have enough kids there and we have um, kind of a kids separate table set up. Uh, One Night Ultimate Werewolf always is played by, by uh, the younger kids. And also Coup, actually, C-O-U-P. Coup. Um, is, is always played and is a lot is enjoyed. And then another one that I know that they enjoy is Dungeon Fighter. That's the one with the target um, and you're throwing dice at the target, trying to get it as, and you're doing a dungeon crawl and the target has rings of different amount of damage that you do to the monsters that come up. And as you throw the dice, they will land on this ring and that's how much damage you'll do. Uh, that's my daughter's favorite game right now. And uh, again, she's only nine, but still, she, Dungeon Fighter, um, I believe the box says it's for 14 and up. So uh, I know it's not a kitty game. It, it actually is geared towards, uh, you know, uh, teens and stuff. Uh, but, um, and the only thing with Dungeon Fighter is I know that there is um, some of the boss bosses that you fight at the end of the game. There's cards for each of the bosses. Some of them, are, their names are puns or references to things. And there's one or two bosses that in a public school environment, you may actually want to go through the boss uh, cards and remove a couple of them because they uh, their names are puns that are double entendres that actually may not be suitable for a public school environment. So um, I mean, there's no cursing or anything, but there are double entendres. So 
Um, so there you go. Uh, King of Tokyo, uh, One Night Ultimate Werewolf, Coup, and Dungeon Fighter. Uh, my top picks there for 12 to 14 year olds in a game club environment at a public school. Feel free, everyone, to add more in the comments and show me how much better picks there are out there than what I picked. Okay. Um, ah, Snow Dragonka, which is how I'm going to pronounce that, uh, states that they had a friend in the group who knew like one word of English. And since their games were not translated to their mother tongue, they spent two hours Googling and printing the translations. And then each turn literally took like 10 minutes while others were done in one minute. And it was a really painful experience. I have had, I know what you mean, I've had a really similar experience to, to that. Um, and it, it, we, I live in a college town. So we have lots of students from you know, other countries come in to go to the university here. And you know that is great, not, not complaining, but that spills over into like the game groups and stuff. You get a lot of the students uh, coming in. And it's, it's one of those situations where um, you, it's really, really can be a challenge to have that open gaming environment, but with the language barrier, um, you know, tr try to not make things, uh, you know, try to make things as, as comfortable as possible. And that is actually something where I think with practice, that's something that requires practice and should be practiced. Because when you have someone like that, I mean, I was telling someone else in our game group, you know, think of the bravery that it takes for this person to travel all the way from another country where they don't speak the language to this environment where they have to acclimate to the culture, acclimate to the language, and then, then go to this new other little clique, um, this little group, and come in as an outsider, and then not only have to have the language barrier, but then have to learn the rules to a game in another language. That's you know commendable and something that I think takes a lot of courage. And so it's something that intimidates me in being on the other side of the fence, having someone come in and, and realize that barrier there. I think it can be really intimidating. And anyone who practices how to deal with that and improve the experience and actually take that on and help those people is like a champion in my book. We had one, we had someone, uh, I believe they were from the, the Middle East, I think maybe Iran, they, they, they came over and uh, they were playing garden dice. And uh, there was someone there that was a teacher um, in the group, it was like, and, and they were helping. Um, they were kind of the working as the liaison for that person. But you could see the frustration in the, the non-English speaker trying to comprehend in English what to do with these dice and uh, how, they, how they lay out and what the rules are for that. And it was a real challenge. So that is something that may actually be a, a good topic for, for a show, for an episode, dealing with non-native speakers. But it's a topic that I think is really dense and and really take need, requires a lot more attention than um, some guy spouting off stuff into a webcam could do it justice. I think it'd take a lot of planning, but I think it's it's one that's worthy of for, of for future discussion to help bring down those barriers. Okay. Um, thank you for the comment and contributing to the discussion. All right. Um, William Wilson, hello, uh, mentions that uh, this is not directly related, uh, sorry, this is not directly associated with game groups, but uh, he got back into board gaming because of his nieces and nephew finding his old copy of HeroScape, and then they tore up the two boxes. So luckily, the only casualty left is a few bent cards and one missing dice. He, he was able to salvage everything he had and then grew it with expansions, and it's all part of his other board games now. So I think what I take away from that uh, is that um, what I want to know is how old the nie nieces and nephew... Well, wow, this table is really wobbly today. I'm sorry. Uh, I want to know how old the nieces and nephew were, because Heroescape 
is one that I've had actually in plastic boxes in my closet for at least six or seven years now, waiting for the day that my daughter is old enough um, to enjoy it without just ripping up the boxes in a theoretical sense. So uh, I, I, was, I was planning on, right before she's 10 years old, introducing her to HeroScape. And I'm assuming she could probably um, play it now and appreciate it. But um, I'm, I'm wondering, though, if, especially with HeroScape, since it's so toy-like, uh, if there's other people that have an experience with introducing it to a child, and what age is the appropriate age to introduce that child where they actually can appreciate the game and it doesn't just devolve into them playing with the figures as toys? Wow, that is an excellent question. And I didn't even know where I was going with that when I started. So hooray for us. We pulled that one out. All right, let's continue on now and see if we can continue continue this uh, this role what we're on. Uh, the Forsaken One chimes in again. Always nice to see your comments. Um, he remembers one. When he used to play Warhammer Fantasy, there was a semi-regular who was deaf. Oh, interesting. Uh, and he had the misfortune of playing with them. Uh, funnily enough, it wasn't the deaf part that was the problem. And that's where his comment ends. Um, oh, yay, he picks it back up. The problem was that the player didn't know the rules. They always played armies that broke composition rules and would always anger angrily <laughs> respond angrily with you if you had somehow got the slightest advantage over them. Needless to say, after they destroyed the Forsaken One with their illegal army and spending the entire hour arguing with them, they never played. They never played with them again. That is, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, wow, this is really turning into a very delicate conversation <laughs> that we're having here. Um, I'm trying to think of the, I'm trying to think of a close experience that, that we've had in our game group. Um, and I really can't, there's nothing, um, there's nothing helpful or witty that I can contribute to that because I haven't had that type of ex experience. I do think, though, that like the language barrier thing, I'm wondering if other people have had similar experiences in their own game clubs, and if there is someone who becomes like the specialist for dealing with people with special needs, um, like deafness or something like that, um, someone who kind of has experience, maybe real-world experience, um, and can contribute to the conversation saying, hey, here's some things to do uh, that you can do to, to help facilitate someone um, that, that is that way. Um, there's, I know there's also, well, it's not deafness, it's blindness, but um, is it Brian Counter who does the contributions for the Dice Tower audio podcast? Um, there's a vision impaired gentleman who just like two or three weeks ago had a very, very good segment on the Dice Tower. So it was around episode 443 to 445 in there somewhere. In the Dice Tower audio podcast around those episodes, there's a really good segment about a vision impaired gentleman who talks about dealing with that on both sides of the fence. And so I really recommend um, checking that out because he's going to speak to this much better than I could about anything. On the other side of that fence, about your comment, I will say this. Um, for a while, right out of college, I worked as, I worked as a, uh, an art teacher at this strange little private school, which is a whole series of videos in and of itself. But there was one day after school, trying to be you know, nice, you know, doing uh, grading homework and stuff, one of the kids said, hey, do you want to play magic? It's like, oh yeah, I, I play magic. So the next day, I brought in a magic deck. And it's like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll play a game of magic with you. And we sat down and we dealed out our, our hands of cards. And the very first turn of the very first game, he picked up his cards and said, oh, the way I play is I just go through my deck until I get enough land. And that's what we do. So he just starts going through his deck, land, land, force, force, planes, force, force, planes, planes, force, planes. All right. He puts his deck down. And I finished that game with as much of a smile on my face as I could muster. 
And then I just never remembered to bring my magic cards with me back to the school ever again and just never got into that situation ever again. So from that point of view, just the people who play creatively, yeah, I can understand wanting to just smile through it and then get out of that situation as quickly as possible. All right. Um, we got plenty more questions here. So let's see if I can uh, channel my inner my inner cubist and do some rapid fire question and answers here. Probably not though, I know me too well. Uh, let's see, uh, next we have, uh, Jerome mentions that he once had a random guy, <laughs> probably under the influence of something, seeing a light at our group place late at night, spectated a game of Avalon Resistance and managed to mark the Merlin card. So this guy just wandered in and watched a while, and then marked the card to help people in future games. Thanks, random guy. <laughs> See, when weird stuff happens at your game group, just remember that we can commiserate with each other, and it, it could always, always be worse. Um, let's see, there was... Um, the cluster of Forsaken Ones comments. I'm going to search the comments again here. Again, I apologize if I skip over anyone's comments accidentally. Um, YouTube jumps a lot, which doesn't make this very easy. Ah, Jarb2104. Hi, Jarb. Long time uh, viewer, and I recognize your comments from a long time ago, so it's always nice to see you chime in. He asks, what game have you been dying to play lately, but haven't had a chance? That's a very good question. And there's another one of those questions where I know that as soon as we wrap up here, I'm going to go, oh, no, no, I meant this one. But um, let me check its name. There is a neat economic game called Captains of Industry, um, where you, um, I, I believe it's one that the sweet spot is four to five players or so. So I believe for maximum performance, it takes a higher player count. But I believe it's also one of those games where the players themselves s establish the prices of all the commodities and things that you're playing in the game. So it's there's a lot of interaction in that way. And I have been dying to play that game and I've brought it and it just, um, it's just a little, takes a few too many people and it seems a little too intimidating. And it has yet to, to hit the table. Um, I, I, if I, there's a certain convention that I'm hoping to get to this year, and if I meet a certain person at that certain convention, I'm hoping to actually convince them to uh, play Captains of Industry with me. But um, that means nothing to anyone else watching this. So let's let's move on. Oh. Um, and I'm going to butcher your name again. I'm sorry. I think you even commented how to pronounce it, but uh, Trekki Baggio, let's go with that this time. Trekki Baggio asks, can you elaborate more about your campaign version of Star Trek Fleet Captains that you mentioned a couple of times in a board game breakfast? Um, yeah, I'll take, uh, I'll take a couple of minutes um, to mention that. So Star Trek Fleet Captains is one of my favorites. It's one of my favorite games. Uh, because it's it's a game, um, uh, I, well, actually, if you want to know more about Star Trek Fleet Captains the game, I'm sure that the, the Dice Tower has multiple reviews and other episodes that will show you what the game looks like and how it plays. But the neat thing about it is you lay out this universe of, of hexagon tiles, and you have your ships, and as you go through, you explore, you flip over the space tiles, and stuff happens, and as you travels and you have a deck of cards of events. So as you go through, there's always this series of random events that happens. So a friend of mine have played this a, a few times. Um, it's one of my favorite games to, to play with him. And uh, he's been my best friend since like second grade. So we have a long experience of playing and tweaking games and, and, and doing RPGs and stuff together. So one time, I didn't even tell him. Um, I, I came over to his house for game day and I set up the game and then I, I had this little uh, dice bag with some stuff in it. I just set it aside. He didn't even notice. So we start playing the first couple of rounds of the game. And I hand him this piece of paper. And I say, here's a message that just came in from Starfleet. 
And he's like, what? And he takes a piece of paper, and it's just like, it's gibberish. Um, it's like a, it was a, a cryptogram. And I, and I tell him, oh, yeah, the, the message that came in, though, it's real garbled. There's some interference going on. And so I was like, well, you know, take your turn. And I kind of pulled out a, a, a timer or, or such, which we kind of abandoned after a while. But we started playing where we continued playing our turns, trying to keep the turns continuing with the same amount of timing and pacing. But while he was playing his terms, turns, he had to solve this cryptogram as well while he was playing from this encoded message for some new mission that he was given. And so after he solved the cryptogram, it was about running this certain scan to find these weird anomalies. And so once he, he, once he solved it and did the scan, I set up these little uh, round markers on several hexes of the board, which were these little gates. Now he had a new mission. He had to make his way to these gates. And once he went through the gates, um, he went, we, I reset the board and he got a whole new mission. We scrapped all the missions that we had up to that point. And so the game kind of started out as a normal game's fleet captains and it morphed into this RPG session. And he got into this new play field. I set a, whole, a new, um, new space area uh, with a gate on one side and another gate that he had to get to uh, to, to kind of you know, finish his scans and return home. And in the middle, I, I opened up the, uh, the little dice bag that I had, and I pulled out this uh, Borg cube from Heroclix that I, had, I got online. I set that down near the other gate. And so this, this Borg cube that we introduced in the game with its own stats and, and rules and, and custom-made uh, spaceship character sheet uh, started coming towards his ship. So the, the game turned into uh, trying to rescue some people that were also next to the Borg ship rescue them, lose as few of his own ships as possible, and make it through and survive making it through that gate. And that became his mission. And um, there's and that was kind of the, the crux of it. Um, oh man, there's there's even more stuff about this that I could go into. Maybe I'll, I'll make a whole, I actually took pictures of it while we played to maybe make a video about it. And I even, I even contemplated taking my camera and just doing a live play session the next time we do this. Uh, because we were going to incorporate cards from this old, the early 90s Star Trek customizable card game into it for equipment and characters. So if we do that, maybe I'll take my camera with me and maybe we'll just record this to kind of to show it. But anyway, that was one of my favorite gaming experiences of like the last five years. Um, mostly because we started out normal and it slowly just morphed into this thing. And it was a total surprise to him. And he was like, I had no idea you were going to do this, but this was awesome. So it, it turned out great. So there, so there you go. An elaboration, elaboration on that. All right. Um, let's go back to the comments to find another interesting story from a contributor here in the comments. Uh, Snow Dragonka um, mentions again that another story comes to mind. Um, they were playing uh, RFTG. Oh my goodness. Race for, the Gal Race for the Galaxy, thank you. They're playing Race for the Galaxy for the first time uh, with their friend, but sadly, they forgot that he was colorblind, so the game was fine, but they kept asking for the colors of the cards, and uh, the commenter felt really dumb for not realizing that it's a bad idea to try and play a game that's reliant on colors. Um, made they finally, which was really cool, the commenter says that they made special stickers on the sleeves afterward. That is cool. S Getting some nice sleeves, putting some stickers on there. That's an awesome idea. Um, I personally, I, I am not colorblind, but in um, our local area, especially our, our biggest convention, I am surprised um, I, I, how many colorblind board gamers I, I run into. There's at least a half a dozen out of a group of 60. Um, so like 10%, it seems, of our local gaming, our, our local gaming group, not group, but a whole community, uh, passive aggressive community, um, are, are, I'd say about almost, it seems like 10% of this specific community is colorblind. And um, it's, it's probably a higher average than the norm, but you always find the games that are an issue for these players. And it's really frustrating um, not only for them, but for me, just to see that there are simple, simple little changes that could be made to a game. You know, 
Um, when you, a lot of games will use red and green, red for negative and green for positive effect. All you have to do is never use red and green. Swap out green for blue, red and blue, red for the negative, blue for the positive. Um, the same thing goes for web design. That's that's my background, especially making uh, complex web interfaces. Um, you know, always keep that in mind in a web interface. Never rely on the color green for anything. It's just a simple little change. Um, and you know, there's there's different varying degrees of it, of, of course. You know, um, but um, and also having shapes to correspond with that. But uh, anyway, that that's a gripe that I have, and maybe that's maybe that's something that would make a good uh, head in the clouds episode. Um, in fact, I'm going to hopefully remember that and and do that. Okay. Um, Suzanne Sheldon, hooray! Um, online board gaming personality extraordinaire uh, has asked a question. So thanks for watching, Suzanne. Oh, can I say that? Is that trademarked? Can I not say thanks for, no, okay, sorry. Thanks for your viewership, Suzanne. Uh, your question is, what happens if you can't tell the difference between someone who is socially awkward, introverted, or just kind of a jerk. Well, two-part answer to that, Suzanne. P speaking from personal experience, why can't a person be all three? But the more seriously on that, though, that's a really good question. Because when someone is introverted, quiet, socially awkward, lots of times the word I hear used to describe that is antisocial. And it's not true. Um, for example, again, using myself as an example, if I have a small group of friends, I'm in your face, super comfortable, ready to go, having a great time. Um, even what's weird, if it is a prepared environment that's really large, like working at a table at the Gen Con booth or a Dice Tower live show where I have prepared a piece and I know what we're going to do. And even if there's a 500 people in the audience, if we're supposed to be there and I'm kind of in control of my contribution to it and it's rehearsed and prepared, no problem again. Put me on stage. There you go. But have me walk into a room with 50 other people who know each other who are gaming. And even though we're all there for the same thing, to be playing games, where I got to go up and ask someone if I can join them or, heaven forbid, interrupt the game that they are doing to ask them, I will just shut down and stand on the sidelines and be awkward. And that can be seen as someone who uh, doesn't want to interact with, with someone and can be seen as, um, oh my goodness, what's the word? Passive aggressive, community, uh, socially. <laughs> Maybe I should just do these in the afternoons instead of the mornings. But um, uh, anyway, someone who is um, that word I just said a minute ago. Uh, thanks for your question, Suzanne. Anyway, but that's not always the case. Now we've had, I have had, I have been in other game groups with someone who is socially awkward, not necessarily an introvert, but misses a lot of social cues that I think straddled that line though between that and being a jerk. And that requires the tough conversations with that person. That requires you to get up the nerve, like I was talking about earlier, which I'm, I have trouble with that type of, of direct um, potential conflict with, with someone. But it's something that if you care about the livelihood, the longevity of the rest of your gaming group. It is something where you have to uh, have those conversations with that person. Not saying you're a jerk, but saying, hey, there is an issue here. When you do blah, we feel this blah way because of blah. And um, that's, that's what it takes. Um, and it's something that takes a lot of diplomacy. All right. Um, so, Suzanne, I hope that uh, hope that helps. And um, I am still trying to remember what the word I just said it. Ah. 
Hey, you want to watch a video of a guy trying to remember a word for 40 minutes? Thanks. All right. <clears throat> um, let's continue on here. Um, Sindane, <laughs> hi Sindane, Sindane comments that they've never had anything so bad as I have. Yeah, I, I have it pretty bad. Uh, but they remember having to explain to university police on a number of occasions what they were doing playing a big board game or D&D at 11 p.m. on campus. <laughs> the man just doesn't understand us. It's true. Oh, uh, okay. Let's. Oh, yeah. I was gonna do rapid fire. Um, okay. I got ten minutes left. Let's see if I can actually even come close to getting ahead. Um, Kristen uh, Geinger um, mentions that they have a they have a player at a monthly meeting who's not really paying attention and misses rules and messes up rules and misses them all the time. Uh, they even mess up with very easy games like pick up. Picomino. I have not played Picomino, so I apologize. I'm going to butcher everything's name. That's going to be my new thing. Um, social anxiety? No, that's not the word. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, well, that, that's a whole other issue, I think. You know, if someone's not paying attention, uh, then that person needs to either start paying attention or find another pastime to do. Because if they don't, if they're not there and they're not interested enough in the game to, to learn how to play it, why are they even there? Um, then, and that's that's something. Fortunately, you're right. I haven't. Oh, that was someone else that mentioned that. Um, I have not had that experience myself. Um, so I rue the day that I encounter that type of issue. Uh, someone else mentions that they had a guy who gamed with their gaming group and insisted insisted on a game of Battlestar Galactica, which nobody else had ever played yet. The bad part of his story is that he insisted on it with all the expansions. Um, I've, I've been there, uh, kind of a little bit different. I've been in a game where, uh, it actually Battlestar Galactica is one of them. I came in as the only player who hadn't played it and sat through and basically watched a game of Battlestar Galactica be being played around me. And really, that, that was not their fault. They enjoyed the game. It was as much my fault. I, I should have known what to expect more going in, but it was a very dry experience. Um, it was also like three hours of watching this game play out. But um, that was another experience of just smiling and nodding. Hey, okay, oh, you, I should do this? Okay, I'll, I'll move my piece there. Oh, your turn now? My turn? Oh, I'll move here? Okay, yo, do you play this? Okay, I'll play this card. Oh, okay, oh, your turn? Yeah. So something to keep in mind when you're introducing games to people. Start small and build up. Um, Brandon says, hi, Chaz. Hi, Brandon. And then he goes on to ask, have you ever intentionally prevented a new game group member from playing with someone who has histor historically turned off new gamers? That's a very good question. Um, the answer to that is no. My game club, we have typically 9 to 19 people show up on any given game day uh, on the game club, on the, the ones where I host them. Our convention has sometimes up a couple hundred people for our, our annual convention, but for the my, my ones I host, nine to 19 people. So sometimes people trickle in as well. So what happens with ours is I have almost the opposite problem where um, we have don't have enough people to split into multiple games sometimes, or we'll have Enough people come in to start one game, and then people will trickle in, and they'll start, all the tricklers will start the next game. And so you can't really have that sort of um, policing of the situation going on event, um, most of the time. Um, the other part of that that's the opposite problem is, uh, as the host oftentimes, I will have to jump out of a game um, and you know let the people know ahead of time, and everyone knows this. But the host usually has to jump out of a game to welcome in new people that wander in so they don't just stand on the wall, you know, especially if this is their first time coming, they don't stand on the wall awkwardly um, doing that word that I'm still trying to think of. But, um, and so trying to make them feel welcome and, and come in. So we actually have the problem where you don't have enough players. And so if there is someone who is a potentially a problem player, 
we can't uh, separate them from new people. And so we have to try and make do as a group uh, to kind of watch that. And um, we've never had anything super severe, but we have had a couple of things where the group has worked together to try and you know, calm someone down in a way or, or keep things moving, especially for new players. That's a good question. Um, all right. Let's go down. Um, then someone was actually following up on, on that very topic, and they mentioned in their own experience that last time uh, they could find a game that was full before she could, uh, that person could play with them. But they really wonder if they should continue this way or if it would be nicer to actually tell the person, hey, nobody wants to play with you. That is a heavy question. And I think that's one where opinions will vary. But my opinion on the matter is that the longer you let it fester, the more difficult it is going to become to solve the problem when it eventually hits ahead and where you can't, you, you have to address it. You have to address it diplomatically as soon as possible. Um, but if you do it too soon, and this is just my opinion, if you do it too soon, the person might think that they're being picked on. You know, if it's like the first time it happens, they're like, hey, that thing happened. Well, you're just being mean because I got upset, or something like that. So you have to find that equilibrium, that sweet spot between f making sure that there is an issue to address and then letting it go on too long. Because if it goes on too long, they're either going to say, well, you know, n you never brought this up before and they're actually going to feel worse. Or someone in the game group is going to get fed up and it's going to just explode in your face and that's going to be far worse. So sooner rather than, than later is my, my opinion. All right. I'm going to, I apologize. I think I'm only halfway through the comments this time. I really have been elaborating on a lot of these questions. I'm going to have to set up one of these. Um, that's a more traditional, just ask me what my favorite thing is, or ask me what I think of this game. I'm going to have to set up one that's specifically going to be quick, uh, quick fire questions. Uh, Bill Corey! That's uh, the, the cubist guy I was trying to think of. En embrace my inner Bill Corey. Sorry, Bill. Anyway, let's answer three more questions here. So let me go and look for an actual question. And I want to thank everyone for hanging out this long. Um, looking for the hashtag here. Um, someone asks that they have an unnatural hatred for Smash Up. Is something wrong with them? No, there's nothing wrong with you. Smash Up, though, is a fine game. Um, an unnatural hatred for any game? You may want to look into that a little bit, but no, I'm, I'm sure you're still fine. I'm sure that if you dig deep, you'll discover the cause of your unnatural hatred. Don't let it be an unnatural. Don't let it be an unnatural hatred. Dig deep. Look within yourself. Find out what it is about the game that bothers you so. And just like the games that any of us speak about negatively, including myself, speak negatively about it if you want, but always be able to back it up with the reasons why. That's what's important to me. Why? Because that's something that we can all work with. I am not good at rapid fire. Um, oh, and the YouTube questions jumped again, so I'm going to research for my hashtag and take one more question here. Which is going to be... Someone I have not read a question from yet. Which may not work. I hate dead air and now we have it. I need a little music player. Here we go. Trevor Just. Trevor Just, who comments with the hashtag TMG? That is the entirety of his comment. I know, even though Trevor used our hashtag in a comment that probably no one would have expected would be commented about on the video, I have done so, and I think that's an excellent place to just blow our minds and end there because um, I'm having trouble finding comments in the first place. So I want to thank everybody for hanging out with me, listening to my true tale of board gaming. And 
thank you just for being here with me in this episode of The Metagame. And as always, for more board game news, reviews, and commentary, be sure to check out and subscribe to both Pair of Dice Paradise, which looks like this, and The Dice Tower, which looks like that. And join us on Twitter and Facebook as well. Um, on Twitter, I am Dice Paradise, and I always enjoy speaking with people on Twitter and getting some Twitter banter going. But until then, and until next time, I have been Chaz Marler, and together with the comments section, we have been playing the metagame. Thanks. I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.